Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, we have two new um, panelists, basically, um, namely Gary Marcus and Terry Sanofsky, um, who we were lucky to get to, to participate in the panel discussion. And of both of you, um, could you please just like um, quickly introduce yourself and how um, your work is relevant um, to the symposium? Uh, sure. I mean, you asked me to prepare slides, so that maybe gives an answer to that. Um, I'm CEO of the company that Zubin Garamani mentioned on the first day, uh, Geometric Intelligence, which has just been launched, and I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience at NYU. Um, and I want to start, if the animation would work and it's a terrible moment for it not to, um, with an email that I got from Jürgen, several of us got from Jürgen Schmidhuber this morning, um, he, which he more or less repeated for Demos. He said, it seems to me that the last time neuroscience contributed something useful to AI was many decades ago. Since I've lost most of my voice, I'll let you read the rest, but you get the idea. Um, the argument is neuroscience isn't really contributing to AI. And I think while there's some room to quibble, and I think Demos made some good points, and I was sick all day, but I bet a lot of other people made good points in this symposium earlier in the day, I think Schmidt Huber is at least partly right. I don't think neuroscience has so far carried its weight in AI. Um, the, a lot of the, the main borrowed idea is hierarchical feature detection, as Schmidt Huber pointed out in his email, and that's over 50 years old. And a lot of the other things that people are calling neuroscience ideas are really ideas from cognitive psychology that are also over 50 years old about memory, attention, navigation, and so forth. And so I think it's actually hard to make a really sharp argument, though I hope Terry will disagree with me because I'm a fan of neuroscience. Uh, but I think it's hard to make a sharp argument that neuroscience has really fundamentally changed AI with any recent ideas. But the fact that neuroscience hasn't yet delivered is partly um, a matter of attitude and sociology and not an inherent limitation. I think it's really important to remember that. Um, I once heard a neuroscientist say, data talks and theory walks, and I'm afraid too many neuroscientists believe that. They think it's all about collecting the data, getting better measurements, and so forth. And there's less, I think, encouragement for people to develop uh, theories. I think there's less funding for it, and I think young people are discouraged from doing it, and that's not a good thing. Still, this is a transitory problem, and eventually, I think neuroscience will contribute to AI again. That doesn't mean if, if neuroscience isn't contributing that we're left with what Jürgen said at the end of his quote, which was that we're left with m math and engineering. I think there's another place, which is cognitive psychology. Wow, you'll be able to see my visuals really well now. <clears throat> I don't know how much I had to pay for that, but that's great. Um, so Josh made, a, I think, a case for uh, semantic network. Somebody in the room is leaning against the lights. Um, that's my prior, and maybe we'll find out who. Um, <laughs> that's my ca <coughs> causal inference. Uh, take, for example, semantic networks. That's an idea from cognitive psychology that's actually been revived in AI in Google's knowledge graph and a bunch of other places. So there are lots of ideas from cognitive psychology that are actually starting to become popular again in AI. Maybe nobody's noticing. Or the show attend uh, tell network is using visual attention. It's again an idea from cognitive psychology. Still, I'm not going to argue, though I am a card-carrying psychologist of a sort, that psychology has <coughs> really carried its weight either. But it's pretty obvious where we should look, which is little children. This is where I want it to be dark, so you can see my kids um, who are uh, on, on that side of the room, uh, two and a half and one year old. Um, I call them my late model in vivo learning machines, and they, I think, offer a lot of insight. Um, you could compare them to current approaches to machine learning, which largely <coughs> try to dispense with trying to infer the inner representations that are used by people. So computation, so instead of having a tree structure like a linguist would spend years trying to discern, you have just, if you're doing machine translation, you've got some words that are paired based on some human uh, created data. You just do it from what I would say is a shadow of the real data. The real data are the representations inside the brain. You're using this shadow. It's sort of like trying to reconstruct the 3D world from two-dimensional data. And it gives reasonably good results. And the more data, the better. Um, you may have seen this graph from the first paper on Google Translate. Um, it showed basically the more data, the better your blue score is. But I'm a psychologist, and I re-graph the axis. And if you go from 0 to 100, getting more data doesn't necessarily help you that much. Um, here's an example I, I cooked up in Dublin last year. It was sort of honoring Noam Chomsky. 
you feed into Google, either the translation of sentences with complex sentence structures into Celtic languages remains remarkably difficult or it doesn't. It goes in um, to Gaelic. If anyone here wants to pronounce it afterwards and teach me, that would be great. We don't have time now. Um, and it comes back, either continue the translation of sentences with complex sentence structures, Celtic language is remarkably difficult, or does it? It's like sort of vaguely related to the thing that we're trying to translate, but it's, it's what a linguist would call word salad. It's a mess. Um, a decade later, after the first papers on Google Translate, it still frequently produces word salad, which is incoherent both at the sentence level and at the discourse level. So you, if you feed in a whole news story, you're going to get something incoherent. It might give you the gist, but you would never, say, put a legal contract into it. And even on its best days, Google Translate still can't answer questions <coughs> about the passage it translates. It's not even set up to do that. It's no match for my two-year-old. So here, here's my two-year-old, when, actually, when he was two and a half, with what he called a fingerberry. He, he coined this um, uh, title in one trial. And uh, one day while I was in California, his mom asked, which of your animal friends will come to school today? And I want to go through the inferences that he made. He said, Big Bunny is going to come to school today um, because, he doesn't say that word aloud, bear and platypus are eating. So my wife goes into his room and finds that he set up this diorama. And indeed, bear and platypus were, in fact, eating, as she points out. And he did this all by himself, which was pretty impressive for a two-and-a-half-year-old. Um, so what does that show? Well, he understood complex syntax as what a linguist would call a WH question. It's fairly complicated. Um, logical reasoning. Um, so he can figure out if one of these things is true, then the other things aren't possible. He can um, make novel answers depending on recent updates to the world. So he doesn't just have a store cached um, answer, but he can update based on new things. Um, he can do pragmatics. You compare this to a system that couldn't do novel updates. Um, it might be confused about Barack Obama. Last year he said he was 53. This year he says he's 54, um, which is it, Obama. Um, so I'm, I'm almost done uh, my, my very quick talk. Here's one shot learning and invention, if I can get the animation to play. Oh, it's sad without the sound. The sound is not actually working. I don't know if we can. Um, are we waking up, he says? Up, says my daughter. Uh, says my son. Mama, says my daughter. Mama, says my son. Then they start giggling and copying each other. They've invented in the, um, this happened after I came back from another trip. Um, they invented a game that I might call the wake up game. One trial learning, if that, and it's really like they're simultaneously like a jazz orchestra creating something. You know, the, the younger one's a year and a half, the older one's not quite three years old. We don't have any idea how to do machine learning that can do that level of um, sophistication analysis from, from such small amounts of data. Until we dive deeper into the mind, we may be stuck between AI systems with limited flexibility where you have to have a little card that tells you what you can ask it. Um, to systems like Facebook's M, which are not limited, you can ask it anything, but they're really driven by humans. Um, so studying human cognition might be the best way forward. Studying the correlations between these shadows, the output data, rather than the thing itself, humans' internal models, probably can only take us so far. Um, last thing I'll, <coughs> I'll say is big data isn't everything. Um, this is my science paper from uh, a long time ago, 1999, showing that infants could learn rules from two minutes of data. Um, and I, since then, I've been trying to argue that understanding how children acquire patterns from small amount of data is essential. I still believe that that's true. I finally decided to put my money or my time, where, well, both, where my mouth is, and I formed a company that's trying to um, learn more powerful abstractions from small amounts of data. Uh, you can come talk to Zuby and I um, about it if you'd like to join, and we'd love for you to join. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, Terry, could you please? Well, say since you, um, you sort of gave me the opportunity here to first uh, thank the organizers, this has been a great uh, symposium. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I think that we, it's the wrong model to think that either neuroscience is going to make a big breakthrough for machine learning, or machine learning is going to make a big breakthrough for neuroscience, systems neuroscience especially. Uh, that's not how collaborations work. If you've ever worked with somebody very closely from a very different uh, part of science, you know, engineering versus biology, you find that there's, there's a fantastic cultural difference and it has to do with their training and the way, that, and the way their conceptual framework. And uh, what I've, you know, felt over the years, because I've worked on both sides of the fence, that uh, it's a translation problem and it takes time. You know, when NIPS first started out, you know, the uh, engineer would go up and talk about some very uh, sophisticated uh, mathematical framework, control theory or something, and the neuroscientists did not understand one word. And similarly, the neuroscientists would go up and use this uh, arcane vocabulary we use for neuroanatomy. And of course, you know, it's, it's like one of these other languages here. It's basically ununderstandable unless you've been immersed in it. But what's, I think, happening now is the younger people growing up 
uh, and here a lot of them are here at the meeting, they, they go freely back and forth between these two worlds. And w where the advance is going to come is uh, at that intersection. It's, it's at the being able to, uh, at the same time, have a conceptual framework that can map onto both uh, really different bodies of, of science. But let me give one example, a concrete example. And here I have, I have a, a prepared talk here. No, I'm not going to give it, but I mean, I, just, I was going to say that if, if you want me to, I will. <laughs> no, uh, so in. You want to stay till midnight? So this happened in my own lab. It's, um, it was really remarkable. Uh, so I came back from Germany, and uh, there's a uh, B neuroscientist there by the name of uh, Menzel, Randolph Menzel, who studies learning in bees. In any case, he had a postdoc who was recording from a bee, uh, one of the neurons in the bee, the vomix one. By the way, it's a, it's, it has a million neurons. It's a champion learner. It can go out. It can recognize flowers by their color, their shape, and their odor, and, and bring up, and with a waggle dance, actually tell the other bees where to go kilometers away. Amazing that nature can do that with a million neurons. But in any case, the, the, uh, I, he had a postdoc who was recording from this one neuron, and it was an amazing neuron that would uh, really carry the information you need when you pair a sensory stimulus with a reward. It was uh, the Vomix-1 midline neuron. Well, I, I took this back to the lab. Peter, Diane, and Reed Montague were postdocs in my lab at the time, and Peter, Diane says, that's Temporal difference learning, reinforcement learning. And so we quickly, within a couple of weeks, had a model together that reproduced a whole raft of papers in B psychology. By the way, I don't distinguish neuroscience and psychology. I think behavior basically is a part of neuroscience. So I, I, I wouldn't draw a line there. OK, so in any case, uh, this led to a resurgence of interest uh, within, and because it, 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 there was a real uh, direct map, actually, to the human brain because of the dopamine system had very similar properties that this one neuron had. And uh, Wolf from Schultz then took this concept and turned it into an experiment. It was a cl cl you know, killer experiment. And, and what you do is, instead of giving the reward, you withhold the reward, and you see that what previously looked like it was zero was actually negative because it was subtracting two things, the expected reward and the actual reward. So this is a fantastic advance for neuroscience. But now what's happening is, that it, uh, you know, the psychology uh, lit literature has exploded, uh, neuroeconomics, a whole new field has started, and you know, it, it's, it keeps snowballing, and now what's happening is we're, we're learning that different parts of the basal ganglia, the, the back part, is more uh, looking for s simple uh, SR matches, whereas the prefrontal part, the VTA projects to the prefrontal cortex, is looking more for model-based. And so as psychologists refine their experiments, and as the neuroscientists actually go in with brain imaging and test them, we're, I think it's going to help a lot when you start doing the, the kind of planning that uh, is going on at DeepMind in terms of more conceptual, more abstract. So I, th I think that uh, this is a perfect time right now for these two communities to work really closely together. And uh, it's really happening. I can see it happening. It happened in my lab, and it can happen in your lab, too. Great, thanks a lot. Um, maybe let me um, kind of um, start there. Um, so one of the mantra of this symposium was like today's science, tomorrow's engineering, um, uh, and the idea that we are interested in understanding human intelligence to get to create um, better um, engineering solutions for intelligence. So um, to the panel maybe, um, what scientific advancement do you think um, will most likely be important to get a better engineering solutions or better understanding of um, human intelligence? I'd be happy to start that. I think um, something that I don't hear much about at this conference is symbol manipulation. I think it's, it's an unpopular topic here, although I loved hearing about the neural Turing machine stuff, which approaches that. And of course, Josh is sympathetic. But by and large, at this conference, people don't talk about symbol manipulation. I was at another panel. I was tempted to ask, how many people have heard of Doug Lennett's psych system? Can we have a show of hands? How many people know Lennett's psych system? It's a very small smattering. I wouldn't say that it works, but it's the best effort, I think, that's out there to try to codify common sense knowledge. I think we need something like that. Maybe it works differently, but works better. And nobody's really taking on that kind of problem of large 
symbolic <coughs> or symbol-like uh, information and how we integrate that with the neural network stuff. And I think when we get some better handle, either through computation or through neuroscience or through psychology, about how the symbols fit together with the pattern learning and so forth, we'll, we'll be doing much better. Symbols are vectors. Well, there, there's a line out there which says you can't stick the whole sentence into a vector. And there's a lot of problems with capturing things like quantification and negation and trying to find the, the right place to put them. Wait, let, me, let, me, let me get in the middle of you guys. <laughs> I would say vectors are symbols, but not all symbols are vectors. And the fact that you can understand the difference between those two sentences or those two phrases really is just the beginning of what I think Gary's talking about. It's, uh, it's also, just to go back to the question that you asked me, um, which, because this is also relevant. You said, well, how do probabilistic programs work in the brain? You could also ask, where, you know, how do symbols work in the brain? I mean, we know something maybe about how vectors work in the brain, and it's a legitimate question to ask you know, probabilistic programs. In a sense, it's the same kind of question. I think that's a really interesting scientific question, but we shouldn't let it constrain the science we do or, our, or, the, or the kind of engineering that we imagine. Uh, Mike Jordan gave a great example of this uh, at his uh, Rummelhart Prize uh, talk. Um, over the summer at CogSci, where somebody asked him, Gary Cottrell asked him, you know, well, you know, I think we should be exploring some more biologically plausible brain things. And he said, looking to deep networks, he said, look, if, if people were, I mean, people have worried since the beginning about whether backprop was biologically plausible and how backprop works in the brain. People are still worrying about it. These guys are worrying about it, and they're really interested in it, <laughs> right? Well, okay, Andrew told me he, he all right, so they're still debating it. <laughs> Andrew's interested in it. Suri thinks it's something else. But the point is, if we had if we had let if we had said, well, we don't know how backprop works in the brain, then none of deep convents would have happened, <laughs> right? Um, so I think it's it's important to simultaneously hold these kinds of questions as interesting scientific questions, let them inspire engineering, but not hold it back. If if I could maybe um, play the devil's advocate and be unkind to every single subdiscipline and characterize them in the most unkind way possible, and then ask how can we, yeah, that that's what we do. Um, but okay, so this this is what we could say, right? In large scale neuroscience, the end product is some big flashy movie of flying through a connectome, huge data sets. You show the movie, you put the image in the paper, you're done. No conceptual understanding. All right, I, I'm being, I, I think these movies are very interesting and we'll, we'll get there. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do them, but that's an unkind characterization of it. Um, machine learning, it's an engineering problem. You just want to win the competition. You want to get X percent better on something. No conceptual understanding of what's going on. Pure theory, conceptual understanding of simple systems. The understanding may be completely irrelevant to the brain and sophisticated machines. All right, if you believe in any percentage, as to any degree of unkindness in any of these characterizations, how do we bridge the gaps? How do we extract conceptual understandings from the movies and data sets that Allen Institute, for example, is collecting and other people are collecting? How do we bring theory into machine learning and create a science of machine learning as opposed to an engineering of machine learning? And then how do we bridge uh, engineering in the brain? Th those are the things we have to do. I think you're confusing the products of neuroscience with, with actual neuroscience. Neuroscience is about understanding mechanism, like Hodgkin Huxley, that we understand in all of us, in all of us present here, even in the basement, the rats and the cockroaches here. That, you know, we understand how electrical activity is stored and propagated, right? That's sort of the principle. Yeah, and it shows up in the way, in the forms of movies, but let's not, let's not confuse the two. Yeah. It's like saying, well, physicists, all they do is generate equations that nobody can understand except a few <laughs> experts, right? That's all what physics is. It's not really understanding. So I agree that that's the highest form of understanding, Hutch and Huxley, all that. But I think here we're at a premature point where technology development is driving neuroscience and we're collecting large-scale data sets, but I think there's a lot more to go into turn, turning those large-scale data sets into a conceptual understanding of how that brain region solves a particular problem, and indeed, what problem is that brain region solving? But that's and always I'm, been the case. So New York Times has yeah. always, 
Neuroscience has always been driven. In the 19th century, it was dye technology. Then it was the discovery of electrodes in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Then it was the discovery of fMRI. Now it's the discovery of large-scale connectomics and optogenetics. Like any science, we're always driven by new technology. But that leads to new conceptual questions that we couldn't uh, have asked uh, 20 years earlier. I, I think uh, Surya yeah, is That's being fair enough. But how do we get there now? Like, what do you see as the pathway now? And the pathway is to what? No, no, it, it's, no, listen, it, this is what, what neuroscience is going through right now. It's going to take a while to settle out. And so what I think you're reacting to is the first blush of data. It used to be data poor. In fact, you know, almost, I would say, nine, for the last 50 years, it's basically, up until recently, it's been painfully uh, recording from one neuron at a time and, and, and cataloging them in, in the hundreds. And, you know, that's uh, led to theories like the grandmother cell theory, which is that, you know, there's a single cell in your brain that recognizes your grandmother. Jennifer Aniston cell, uh, which, you know, it's basically, it could be called the microelectro theory of the brain. But, uh, but, but can populations, I now that we can see what the vector looks like and how sparse it is and how it's transformed from layer to layer, and in one of the, I think, really important discoveries that's been made in, in terms of the actual, you know, what's really going on in deep human learning in terms of the hierarchy, is that it's not just uh, the same thing repeated, the same... Uh, <coughs> layer repeated, as you go f higher and higher, especially into the prefrontal cortex, the time scales with which you integrate the information gets longer and longer. And that means when you're saying sentences, for example, the auditory cortex is doing it really rapidly, one word at a time. But by the time you get to the prefrontal cortex, it's being organized in a very geometrical way, and it sticks around. That's, that's what uh, the memory, uh, breakthrough in memory was with, with, with the LSTMs. So I, I think that uh, th there's, you know, a whole new conceptual framework now that we're just building, and I think these networks are helping us understand those concepts. And I think that Surya's analysis is providing us with the beginnings of a real theory. I think that the single best thing that people in this room could do would be to expand the repertoire of models that we can compare this onslaught of data with. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the fact that there's enormous diversity in the brain. So um, at the Allen Institute, Christoph just told me about the magic number 42, which is a certain you know, number of neuron types in a certain spot. Probably the number will go higher. Um, why are there 42 neurons in one particular spot or 70 in the retina? Why are there hundreds of different molecules, as, as um, Stephen Smith also at Allen Brain Institute has documented? The models that we have are very simple compared to the diversity and complexity that we're seeing in the brain. And I would hope that some people in this room would, would take us up on that and say, well, what can you do with diversity if you've got it? Why would you have it? So, so I think um, a lot of the comments here are, you know, that have been a bit, a bit sort of missing the point in the sense of, you know, building, trying to build AI is an incredibly hard problem. So we should be using every single source of information that we can and throw it to throw at it. So it's not neuroscience versus psychology or neuroscience versus engineering. It's all of the above. You should be doing all of the above together in an integrated way, like Terry was saying, and we can do that now. And moreover, just to make sure people are clear on this, is that we use systems neuroscience as inspiration, but because we're primarily interested in building AI, um, we also need to understand the mind, but primarily building IA, we don't constrain ourselves to only biologically plausible solutions. But it's one of the orthogonal pieces of information. And, and as we know, if you get orthogonal evidence from two sources about one thing, then that's incredibly strong evidence for that, right? Like the TD learning that Terry was talking about, that's, that's absolutely seminal, that work. And that was really key for us to making a very big bet on RL. Of course, there was RL going on before, but we know it will scale. We know it will because because of, of, of this work by Schultz and Terry and Peter Diane, who are, you know, I did my postdoc with Peter Diane, so I know that work very well. So I just don't really understand this sort of debate, which one's better, what one should, we should do all of them and integrate them all together yeah. um, and, and try and mine that information from all these things. And we're in the main, and, and they're also very interesting in their own right, of course, as well. So I, I just want to insert one sentence. Um, I don't disagree with that at all. I think we, in fact, want all that unification. I just think psychology gets a bit neglected, gets the short stick. I think Josh probably agrees. Um, I, I, I do think psychology is neuroscience at some level, but I think it doesn't get the press, and I wanted to give it a little press. No, no, I, agree, I agree with child psychology is extremely important. But you know, to answer Jürgen's question, wait, Jürgen's over there, you know, why would you want to ignore some source of you know, incredible piece of, of not information? No. You know, I, I know nobody up here is, but there are many, maybe there's other people in the audience with that view, and I just never understand that point. You've they got this to the amazing... other workshop. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, but I mean, uh, Syria, um, I it was interesting that you kind of left out psychology or cognitive science. Um, from your critique, yeah, 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 please. <laughs> so, 
So I don't believe this, I love Josh's stuff, but here's an unkind characterization of it. <laughs> He's doing probabilistic inference of our programs, it's combinatorial large uh, spaces, it'll never scale up, the brain can't be doing it, and it must be doing something else. Symbols are patterns of vectors, of patterns of activity in the brain, there's no way around it. Okay, done. Well, okay, so obviously, Symbols, if they're sim, if, if they're sim, thank, thank you, and I love yours very much. If they're, seriously, and, and I love that one, one of your main examples was inspired by cognitive science, like stuff that I've worked on too. With, and, and, okay, so. I want to move into cognitive Yeah, but I mean, but, but the kind of, but lis, listen to the, the different things people are saying here, because the, the subtle differences are, I think, really important, right? Of course, nobody could argue that if symbols are in the mind, then they must be in the brain somehow. And there's nothing in the brain except patterns of neural activity, probably, I mean, there's something to, something like that. So obviously symbols must be some kind of pattern of activity, whether they're just vectors. I mean, I think, you know, here's a place where Gary has argued that symbols in language and cognition need to go beyond just simple kinds of things like that. If you guys, if pe people are interested in this, come to the workshop tomorrow on symbols and neurons where we're gonna be debating these things. I'll, I'll show, for example, a very simple kind of challenge data set in very simple kind of language understanding that to date, none of the best recurrent neural net models for language, and we've, 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 I th we think we've actually tested the state of the art, are able to address a very simple aspect of language understanding. It, I bet they could. I hope one of you guys will figure out how to do it. <laughs> so I'm not trying to be, um, you know, I'm not trying to be a, a negative critic. I'm just trying to say there are real challenges here. Your brains will do exactly the thing I'll show you tomorrow, and then let's get something like a neural circuit to do it. Tom, do you want to? Yeah. I I think this has been said already several times. I think uh, the brain is a great problem. This also means a very difficult problem. I think we need all, all we have, all we can get our hands on in order to make progress on it. This means cognitive science, neuroscience, computer science, engineering. No questions about it. Um, you know, AI in the 50s, um, in a sense, failed because it was computer science and just common sense, you know, just personal feelings of what was going on in the brain of Marvin or uh, <laughs> other people involved at the time. So um, this time we want this to be different. And I think as Terry mentioned, it's a great time to collaborate. We all need each other. Um, not easy to organize. It's the same problem the deep mind has. You know, to organize um, is, is not just the Manhattan Project. It's more than that because the Manhattan Project was uh, science but a lot of engineering. People knew that an A-bomb was possible and so on. Um, we really don't know whether, uh, you know, an artificial intelligence is possible. We don't know whether we can solve consciousness or the brain. I personally think so, but we have just to try. But, you know, just to, this is very general, very kind of metaphysical. Um, let me mention one example, very specific, of something that comes from, um, from neuroscience, cognitive science, everybody knows, and I think will have profound effects in uh, um, understanding human vision and developing different systems for computer vision. And this is the simple fact that um, our acuity depends strongly on eccentricity, very strongly. You know, we have in uh, V1 probably simple cells that are as small as uh, um, about one cone, excitatory cones, and uh, maybe a couple of uh, um, inhibitory cones nearby, and uh, they may be um, uh, just uh, at that resolution uh, covering only um, around half a degree of your vision, right? Half a degree is a fraction of my thumb at this length. This is one or two degrees. So that's very small. And conversely, there are simple cells, either in one or other areas, that are uh, 10 or 20 times larger. So, and they cover around five degrees or so. All of these data that I mentioned to you are uh, reasonable estimates, plus or minus a factor two. Um, but that means that when we look around at high resolution, we can at most see um, you know, half a degree. That's very little. 
five, five degrees coarsely. And in each one of these levels of resolution, as many as five or so, you have only fa 40 by 40 units, simple cells. So I think all of this has a lot of implications. For instance, that when you recognize an image, the recognition is based on fragments that a certain resolution are pretty small, less than 40 by 40. And this, there is psychophysics that Shimon Ullman has done on these MIRCs, minimal, minimally recognizable images that you know, support this. Uh, and I think the design of a system that works this way will require fixation. For instance, the old design of this system means that scale invariance is much more important than translation invariance. And the evolutionary reason is probably that it's easy to move your eyes if you want to correct for translation. It's very difficult to move yourself if you want to correct for scale. So you want to have scale invariance more than translation invariance. So anyway, I'm not saying that the computer vision system that you get out using this framework would be better than, say, the uh, system based on uh, the image net systems. Um, I think it will be different. That's related to the what I was saying about, you know, there is human vision, you can solve it. There are other forms of intelligence, in this case, visual intelligence, that I'm not sure you can say they're better or worse. They have different properties. For instance, why in image net you need to test with, you know, the response has to be among five choices. That's the, the reason is that the systems as they are don't fixate. That's it. And that's quite different from what we are doing. Anyway, just that's my personal bet. We may be interested to ask other people. I'm not saying this is the only one. I'm saying that this, this one of just eccentricity dependent size of receptive field in the ventral stream will have a profound effect in um, you know, the, the, the outline of the vision system, the fact that you will have to keep a, a kind of hippocampal type of map of pointers or places where I have looked corresponding to the illusion that all of us have, that at any given time I see all the room, when in fact I'm seeing with reasonable resolution only a very small part of it. But I can move my eyes where I want, so this implies the existence of some map um, that has not been found yet. Um, anyway, so it would be interesting to, um, to hear other bets about you know, scientific um, data or research direction in, uh, in vision or in the brain that could be important for the future engineering. Okay, uh, here's my bet. So um, I, I think you know, we've had these amazing successes in a lot of perceptual tasks, but to me, I think where the, the, the engineering systems are most blocked is still on action selection. So we have these amazing systems from Demis where you have deep cue learning, but it's still using a deep network, I would say, an essentially perceptual role. So it's, it's using deep learning, but it's not using what I would say is the central intuition from deep learning, which is that you should compose together simple things into more complex things. So to me, a truly deep learning system in the action case should be some form of hierarchical action system. So you have sub-actions uh, that you compose together to get more complex actions. It's actually this uh, sort of action hierarchy. So I think we're kind of stuck here on the engineering side. We have some ideas, uh, you know, there's, there are a variety of hierarchical reinforcement learning schemes, but I don't think any of them are fully satisfactory. And yet there is uh, some interesting evidence, for example, Matt Botvinnik's work, uh, at, I guess he's now at uh, DeepMind, um, maybe that's a hint, uh, who, uh, you know, is, uh, has studied hierarchical reinforcement learning, right? So to me, uh, maybe that's one place where you could look at the brain and learn some more. And just to, to, to say a little bit more about why I think action is so important is I think it runs you straight into causal learning and causal knowledge. Um, so when I see Josh's examples, I actually think a common denominator among a lot of those impressive examples is action selection, right? So you're drawing the actual characters. Um, so incorporating that and understanding how the brain does that can, to me is a Can I make a comment on that? Or do, do you want to follow up on that? Oh, they have a direct yeah. follow up? Yeah, follow up and then I'll follow okay. up. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's very, this is, this is really interesting. Pa uh, Pat Churchill and I wrote a book chapter which has been cited something like, you know, 2,000 times. Uh, and and the, 
the title, I, possibly because of the title, uh, it's a critique of pure vision. And the, the, the point that we tried to make in it was that uh, we, uh, our intuition about vision is, has really misled us in many ways. And I think Tommy's point is exactly right, which is that uh, it looks as if, you know, uh, we have clear view of everything around us, but the reality is we know that you have a fovea and you're only getting snippets of the world and somehow we paste them together, right? That's the mystery. And there are all these fantastic experiments that have been done by psychologists, beautiful experiments, um, where uh, th th what they do is they uh, flash a picture, a complex picture like a scene, and then uh, it goes off for a second and comes back and something has changed, change blindness. And you cannot, for the life of you, figure out what it is unless you happen to be looking at the object when it disappears. It's really dramatic when you see it. And what's amazing is that after you see it, you can't not see it. <laughs> Your brain has changed. It's not the same brain anymore. So I think, I think that, uh, and I think one of the reasons why good old AI went off the rails was they trusted their intuition about what the problem was they were trying to solve or what, what, what the uh, solution was. And there's no reason why biology or evolution should ever have given us any insight into how the brain works. I mean, you know, it's survival that's important. You know, you don't really want to know what's going on in your visual system. You want to see. So I think that's why it's just a t tough problem because it wasn't built by a human engineer. It was evolved, and it may be very different from what we imagine it might be. Oh, um, yeah, so just to also follow up on that, I think it's a great point to make a connection between action and actionable representations and causal models. I think they're very connected. I think it's part of why we've been interested in studying what we did. Um, and it's also part of how I think to go back to one, the other set of questions, um, how we might close the gap to the brain, right? I think in, in both, like um, the, in the handwritten character stuff, one of the things that Brendan is currently doing, Brendan Lake, is actually trying to study these kinds of representations in the motor cortex. And there's good reasons from prior work to suggest that even when you just passively view a character, you see some, um, you have some premotor representations, and he's looking to see if, if uh, you can see that in a much more interesting fine grain structure, which his models can help to decode. On the, the, st the stuff I briefly talked about with the physics engines, right, with the, you know, imagining the blocks falling over, some really nice work by my MIT colleagues um, in Nancy Kamwisher's lab and Jason Fisher, they've actually uh, found you know, some, something of the neural circuits that seem to underlie performance in those and other kinds of visual intuitive physics tasks. And they also combine a combination of parietal and premotor sort of actionable representation. So it does seem like there's a link between the kinds of causal models that we're talking about here and the way we plan our actions in the world. But I want to also turn this into a challenge, a, a place where, again, coming from uh, basic psychology, although it, though there have been decades of experiments along these lines, you can just do it as a thought experiment too. A challenge for really all the people interested in RL, including Demis, because <laughs> um, I think this is this is really interesting in Atari video games, actually, right? I mean, it's it basically goes back to the idea of model model based learning, right? And Tolman's latent learning and learning models that are not just depend on the reward signal we're getting or the task we think we're doing right now, right? It's one of the most foundational results in cognitive psychology is that we can learn a model and then use it for new things that we didn't know we were gonna do when we uh, learned the model. And I think you can see this in a really neat way in video games, right? Think, remember when you, you know, some of you probably are playing a lot of video games. For me, I have to go back to my misspent youth. But when you learned, say, how to play an Atari video game, you didn't just learn how to maximize score. Think about all the different goals you could, and often kids do adapt all, all sorts of different goals that they put their knowledge to. Like for example, sometimes when you're playing a video game, your goal is to die as quickly as possible. Right? <laughs> like, you know, you say, time to go. You say, okay, let me just die. So then you use your knowledge to do like the worst possible thing, <laughs> right? Kill yourself immediately, right? Or sometimes your goal is, you know, you're playing with a friend, and you just want to, uh, you don't want to embarrass them, you want to beat them, but like not by too much, right? That's another goal. Or sometimes your goal is to like get a certain score so that it will spell out a really cool thing when you, t when you take a picture and turn it upside down or like some swear word or something in Atari digital. Or sometimes your goal is just to get to a new level, right? It's n like you, 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 when you're exploring the game, your goal isn't just to get score. You're just like, okay, let me get through this level as quickly as possible so I can get to a new place and start doing that. And so I, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I bet you guys have something to say about that, but it's also a question for RL systems in the brain. How does rich model-based learning work in the brain? Because like, we have every reason in the world to believe that it's gotta be there. Basal ganglia. And the, 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 the yeah. 
It's uh, well, not where, but uh, how. Demo, no, let me hang on. I mean, I'll just say, obviously, we're hugely interested in hierarchical RL, and I agree with Andrew that that's one of the main, you know, things that we need to have a breakthrough in. Also, we're very interested in sub-goal generation. Um, there's also issues of intrinsic motivation there that are coming in, you know, that novelty seeking, these kinds of things that are driving behavior, not just um, the top level goal or score. So we're looking, we're researching all those areas to, and in fact, we need some of those solutions to solve some of the games, even some of the Atari games, like our Mount Everest is um, Montezuma's Revenge, which doesn't have much score and is incredibly dangerous well, where almost everything kills you. So initially, um, the agents just learned to sit still on the start platform because they, they had never seen any reward in the world and all, they ha all that happened to them was they got killed instantly. So it seems like quite a reasonable thing to do. Um, at least that's our in interpretation of what's going on there. So um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're working on a number of approaches to try and solve that. I would say it's one of my, our most active research areas. Yeah. By the way, I never gave the punchline for our book chapter, which was a critique of pure vision. And, and the, 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 the number one was that you shouldn't separate vision from the rest of the brain, the sensory systems, because there's so much feedback. And number two, we at the end of the day, when you and this has been iterated a couple of times, I just want to make it really something you remember, which is you really want to start from the motor system. Because without the motor system, you can't move. And that's really the purpose of the brain, is to move you around so that you're out of danger and you can find the food. And, and, uh, and that's really what, what the, all the representations are funneling in there. And if you don't have a motor system and your deep network, you then you know, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, and okay, so, so another comment you're is. You're going backwards. Yeah. Um, in Josh's presentation, he kind of went easy on you in the sense that he gave you these sort of simple physics stuff. It's just maybe a little bit beyond what you can imagine your deep networks doing, but he could have gone way further, right? There's things like theory of mind where you're interpreting other agents as rational thinking beings and interpreting their goals and how they're acting. It's like, okay, you know, the dog is running after the frisbee because it likes frisbees and things like this. And I think that's all again about action, about interpreting other agents as acting agents. Um, and so that it's actually the, the space of problems is incredibly rich here. You can learn uh, all kinds of things from observing an intentional agent action, acting as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we think action's massively important, which is why we chose an agent-based sort of setting for all our research, so that it emphasized action from the beginning. And, and I think, um, you know, it's, you can't have intelligence without that. I want to emphasize something Demma said earlier that relates to what Josh was talking about, which is transfer. So I think to do transfer learning well, you need better generative models. I think <coughs> it's one thing to memorize a simple Atari game, but to really go from like one game to another, one first person shooter to another, you want some more abstract <coughs> excuse me, representation. Um, so we are already over time, um, but um, we promised to open the panel discussion <laughs> to the audience. Um, so if anyone has interesting questions he li would like to ask the panel. Oh, OK. <laughs> so surprising who's there first. <laughs> Somebody I'd cited you, Jurgen, I'm sure. Somebody. Were you abused as a child by a New York Times? <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. My first name is you again. Because it because it uh, sounded uh, easier to pronounce than oh no not you again. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, uh, tomorrow I just wanted to point out tomorrow at the Deep Reinforcement Learning Workshop, which is organized by Satinder Singh and I think Rich Sutton and, and colleagues, we will address all these issues that came up: hierarchical, <laughs> hierarchical reinforcement learning, transfer learning from one task to the uh, to the other program learning, where the programs invoke sub-programs that are solution to previously learned programs and, 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 and tasks and so on. So all of that has a long history, at least <coughs> 25 years or something, and progress has been made all the time, and there's a lot to say about that tomorrow at the Deep Learning, <laughs> uh, Deep Reinforcement Learning Workshop. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going okay, to um, may I step a question. <laughs> yes, I have a question. <laughs> so listening to you all talk, I hear um, that there's a big need for diversity. I see 
very different perspectives, and I, 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 I keep thinking that there's a need to have people that are good at bridging disciplines. And as I do that, I think, well, women tend to be very good at that. <laughs> and I'm wondering why there's not a woman on the panel. And um, <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, Thanks just for pointing it out. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I just think um, it, it is, it's really something that women are very, very good at. And it would be something that would be, um, I think it, would, it, it looks like it's something that's needed in the field. And I just wanted to say that. I have a question. <laughs> if, you, if you have time for one more. Yeah. Despite all of your friendly dis disagreements, the thread through most of what you've said, as far as I can tell, is a focus on tasks that almost all humans can do, even young humans, maybe very young humans. And obviously there are also domains of expertise of tasks that are difficult for humans to do, mathematics and music and programming. And I'm curious whether you believe solving the tasks that you focused on tonight will be prerequisites to further automation of these expert human domains and there will be just a continuum from one to the other or whether you expect that entirely different techniques might be necessary or might be accessible now in some of these more, let's say, advanced domains? My answer would be that it's a very multidimensional thing. It's not unidimensional. So already we can have expert level chess without solving any of these other problems. And <coughs> it's going to depend on what domain you're talking about. In the abstract, it's hard to say. There are things like <coughs> where you want to understand human language in order to do the next task where there's some kind of prerequisite structure, but it really depends on the task. Um, I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. I, I guess I would say that um, for me the focus on these things that basically all humans do well, even young humans, is really motivated by the, the goal of reverse engineering, right? It's very much what we're all committed to here. This, this, this is an engineering-based science. We're trying to reverse engineer how the mind and brain work. And your best bet is to do that for systems that were actually engineered, right? I mean, we can talk about exactly how we think brains got to be where they are, but, um, and Gary and I have recently debated about this, but I don't think we really fundamentally disagree. Uh, you know, evolution is a kind of design process. It's a kind of engineering. It's not the most efficient. It takes a long, long time, but look at what it did. <laughs> and um, in some sense, uh, as Pedro might say, it is the master algorithm, right? So, okay, so if we have some, lo looking at the capacities that in some sense our minds and brains were engineered to do, I think that's just the best target. And, and then I think that, you know, you, you point to chess, right? So while there are human level, uh, really, world champion level chess playing programs, everybody will tell you that they, they don't do it the way humans do it. And I, I do think that our best bet to understanding uh, you know, all those other kinds of things, including mathematics, including chess, including also the flexibility of, you know, while we have a human level expert chess playing system, you change the rules in some way, you, you know, you, you, can, you can stump them just like you can stump any current AI system. I think that by, by following this reverse, reverse engineering path where you start with the most basic uh, cognitive abilities and then you know, try to get, uh, you know, follow along the path that led to the more advanced ones that, that we're likely to uh, come up with more interesting solutions to those more advanced kinds of cognition. Well, the mathematics is a particularly good example because I don't think there was any drive in evolution f for us to do mathematics, right? I mean, did it, you know, did, did it make you stronger, faster? In, in some ways, it makes you weaker. <laughs> But somehow, it, we were able to use the machinery that evolution gave us to do something which is really amazing, you know, abstract mathematics of very, many different sorts. And it, it, that means that w w you know, the cortex and all the basal ganglia and all the machinery there is, is in some sense a, a general purpose uh, learner and creator of conceptual frameworks. And I think that gives me a little bit of hope that, in fact, uh, you know, if we understand it first in vision, the best understood part of the cortex, then we'll be able to generalize that to some of the other parts that are not as well known. I mean, evolutionary, you can make an argument if you look at the brain parts that we think are involved in mathematics, for example, from De Haines' work, that it's re it, at the structural level, it looks very, very similar to all the other cortical areas. So, you know, it's an evolutionary adaptation of pre-existing abilities like anywhere else in evolution. So once we understand the basic principle of computations, I think these other ones will, will, um, 
will fall out relatively easy. Um, okay, let's take two to three more questions. Um. Um, hi, I, so there was a lot of awesome talk tonight about collaboration between various disciplines. I'm kind of curious what the, your opinions are on uh, the implications of this on kind of the structure of academia, what a PhD should look like. Um, should a PhD be a deep dive into one very tiny thing or should there already be an attempt early on in people's careers to go across disciplines? Um, what does this mean about, yeah, I'll start with that one, but Ned. I can say that. I think, I, I think as an undergraduate, it's incredibly important to do a deep dive into something and even as a graduate student. But you know, take classes in other fields, talk to people in other fields. I mean, my trajectory is I did a deep dive into string theory, completely irrelevant to in, in detail to anything that I'm doing now. But the deep dive into the mathematics and thinking and all that, which is very useful to me in general. So I think it's incredibly important to obtain a very, very deep education. Uh, you know, but then at the same time, just talk to a bunch of people and take classes outside your domain. And then as a postdoc, start to bridge to other domains. And then as a faculty, you know, really start bridging. And then when you're tenured, you can do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> yeah, in, uh, I can tell you what uh, our Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines is doing. It's certainly trying to uh, uh, form, educate a new generation of students and faculty members that are proficient in all these areas of neuroscience, cognitive science, and uh, machine learning computer science. For instance, we have a summer school in Woods Hall, and uh, I think uh, if you, are, if you should perhaps have a look at our website because we had it for the last two years, it's three weeks, and the feedback we got from students was fantastic. So it's trying to get you know experts in computer science, machine learning up to speed on the cognitive neuroscience side and vice versa. And I'm not saying this should be what you do as an undergraduate, because my personal feeling is you should just learn mathematics, that's it. But, <laughs> but, but, but it, it's, at some point, you, you want to know where to look, and you want to know with whom you should speak if some problem comes up. It means having a general knowledge of all these areas. You know, I did the same thing you guys did, so I mean, I'm not going to say it's a, the wrong thing to do. However, it's a lot easier to absorb conceptual structures when you're young. If you wait until you're a postdoc to even begin to understand something about biology, it's, it's almost too late in a sense because it's a very different uh, type of science that requires you know, you have a system where you have uncontrollable variables, very high dimensional. I mean, and the, the brain makes it even more difficult. But, but it, it, it really, I think, if you think you want to go into neuroscience, you, sh you should, along with your math courses, you know, uh, start, just start talking to people who are working on the brain. And you'll discover that by osmosis, you'll be absorbing that. But it's, I think that uh, it, you don't want to be too narrow, I, I think. Uh, Deep dive, but you also want to, you know, spread yourself out, and so that you have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, of cross-disciplinary uh, thinking. If you want to get a lot of grant money, study something really narrow. If you want to change science, get that inter interdisciplinary training early and push it hard. Um, I think Pedro, you are the next. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, more than half of the speakers, you know, mentioned the, you know, uh, Hubel and Wiese, Neocognitron, uh, you know, uh, Condnets, deep learning as, as a great example of how progress can happen in this, in this area, and it is. On the other hand, one salient feature of it is that it took 50 years to happen. And we don't want the next ones to take 50 years because if that's the case, then we will take hundreds or thousands of years to get to AI. So my question for the panelists is, how do we make this loop faster? How do we make the, the next thing happen in five years instead of 50? So uh, two years ago, they, uh, the president announced the Brain Initiative. And the stated goal was to get engineers, computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists to work directly with neuroscientists 
in order to accelerate progress by making devices, and Christoph gave a beautiful talk about where we are, uh, in order to accelerate what we know about the brain so that we wouldn't have to wait 100 years, so that we could do it over the next 10 years. And that's why I, I, I said uh, this is a fantastic time, because over the next 10 years, we're going to figure it out. Christoph. So I've, given a lot of, I've been given a lot of money and a 10-year plan to understand the brain. However, I also have a donor, Paul Allen, who's asked how many Nobel Prizes is it going to take to understand the brain? Is it going to be 50 or 100? And that's it. If it, I'm, now, I'm not talking about the AI. I'm trying to understand uh, this brain that, as Terry says, is characterized by a, 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 a very, very large degree of freedom in a system that's very far away from equilibrium. And so you, uh, most of the standards that Mac just simply doesn't apply. And there's a lesson here. If you look at the war on cancer, the war on cancer was started under Richard Nixon in 1970, 1971. Immediately led to a quadruple of the federal budget of the National Cancer Institute. Not like the Brain Initiative that led to an increase of 0.12% of the total NIH budget. And it's only now, 45 years later, right, 45 years after this so-called war on cancer started, that we understand enough about, about the basic biology of cancer that we have things like Gleevec and that we have things like immunotherapy, that are really rational design therapies where we really begin to understand the mechanism of cancer. And the brain probably is vastly more complex because the brain not only consists of cells, like any cancer cell, but it's also this network thing. And so by that measure, we, you know, the road is going to be, it's exciting, but the road is going to be um, a long one to understand brains. And I, I mean, personally, I think we'll have AI way before we have uh, understanding of, uh, of our own brains. Yeah, I mean, I think one answer to that, you know, what we're trying to do at DeepMind is that I think we should be looking at the ways we structure how to do science. So everyone's talking about interdisciplinary science is a great idea, and I think, you know, that's been the sort of lip service buzzword for a long time, but actually how much interdisciplinary science goes on at the really fundamental level in many academic institutes? And I think as a company, we've tried to organize it sp specifically around that, and sort of touching on what some other people said about we have very fluid uh, dynamics between our groups, so there's very little siloing. Um, you know, quickly small teams reform and, and, and sort of unform, and then, you know, new types of teams come together around a certain project in very short timescales. And when we do have, you know, one way we get around this problem of going deep and, and being general is we have, obviously, if you've got a company or a big organization, you can have both types of people, and they're essential. You know, the deep, world-class experts in certain areas, and then equally valuable are amazing generalists that can actually connect between those world-class experts. And you need a mixture of both of those, and with both of those types of people being empowered to do their bits, and in a very collaborative, open environment, where one thing, I think, problem I think that happens in academia is it's hard for the generalists to get the same respect as the deep uh, specialists, because of the way, you know, this, this would be a whole deba evening debate on its own, but because of the way you get grants and, and, and the way committees work, you know, it's hard for them to judge a, gen a true generalist. Um, but in a company, you can change all of that. So um, I think that, you know, one answer to that is innovating on the way that we do big science. So I'm curious, how many women do you have in your company? <laughs> um, not enough. I mean, we, we, yeah, so, you know, please apply. The, the, the lady that said earlier, I, I agree. You know, we, we, and we actually don't have enough generalists. They're the hardest people to find, the people who are deep enough but, but have, have, have taken the harder path, in my opinion, of, of being general. And, and I also agree with you, Terry, actually. I think you should do it the earlier you do it, uh, you, you've got to get some core skills like coding and maths, you know, the basic core skills um, and, and pro, you know, pro, uh, problem solving skills. But then beyond that, I think you should be quite broad in terms of the content that you're trying to learn. So Tommy wanted to ask this. Just, uh, now I'm always surprised how um, unrealistic people are. If we say that the problem of intelligence is you know, one of the great problems in science, maybe the greatest one, and the other problems are the origin of the universe, the structure of time and space, the origin of life. I mean, and then we say that 50 years for solving the problem is too short. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and what does it mean to solve any one of these problems? Um, it's kind of a, we can say, rate of convergence. We can say that there will be a lot of uh, byproducts and progress done on the way, and I'm sure of that. I also think we'll get there in terms of making machines that are uh, amazing, um, but I think it would be quite some time before we solve the problem of intelligence. Um, 
There's a wonderful book written by my, I actually had two advisors. One of mine was uh, Tommy Poggi, and my other advisor was Valentin Breitenberg. He wrote a wonderful book called Vehicle, The Law of Uphill Analysis and Downhill Synthesis, in which he tried to demonstrate that if you, uh, if you use simple neural networks and put them together in a particular way, in a relatively easy way, you can synthesize very complex behavior that, from the, that, that if you wanted to analyze it from the outside, is very, very difficult. And that's the task that we neuroscientists face. We're trying to understand the, the brain without knowing its, its rules, while AIs try to emulate something, which by this argument should be much easier. But there are also salutary lessons in, in biology. So for instance, if you look at this big data analysis of cell lineage, like they do, for example, here at the Broad Institute, they make these complicated networks where there are thousands of, of so-called lineage factors that all interact in order to try to understand the, the, the sort of the lineage of one particular cell. And then Yamanaka, four years ago, goes in and uses just four of those 2,000 transcription factors, okay? And he takes any cell, he takes a cell from first in mouse and two years later in a, from a human, any cell, you put it in a dish, you add four transcription factors, the right one, and suddenly you get inducible pluripotent stem cell, which now you can turn into any possible cells. So it turned out you didn't need big data, you didn't need 2,000 factors, you just needed to have some intuition about the right factors. So it's difficult, but not hopeless. I think this is a good time to stop, actually. So um, uh, thanks a lot for all the speakers and panelists for the really interesting symposium. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Music